So thank you so much for coming and thank you to our panelists for being here. You guys are navigating the pandemic well and have some interesting insights that we are super excited to hear about this morning. I'm gonna introduce you um, and then I'm going to have you actually tell us about your business and how many years in business you've been in um, and just to kind of give us a little bit of a background. So I'm gonna start with Brendan and Brittany and they're with Flour and Salt in Hamilton, New York. Um, I started working with Brendan and Brittany, I can't even remember how many years ago, it's been a long time and thank God because you, you guys have evolved and shown us so much over the years. So I'm so excited that you guys are here. And I really um, can't wait to hear what you've done and, and how you've pivoted and some, some useful information that we can share with our, our clients and, and just the public. Um, I've got Tucker Ray from Ray Brothers and he's in Madison, New York. He has a barbecue restaurant. It's also a music venue which is pretty cool. And I'm sure he'll tell you more about that. It's owned with his brother, Colin. Um, I went there last night for dinner and it was amazing, of course, as always. It's always such a good time. And then we've got um, Matt from Hope Cafe and that's Mark Pizzanzo's client. Um, I know you've been talked about many a times in our team meetings. So I'm super excited to meet you and hear about you. And, and uh, I know that you've done a lot of different pivoting things as well during this time. So thank you so much to the three of you being here, the three businesses being here. Um, I'm gonna just have you quickly tell us about your business, how many years in business. I, I said the locations, um, but tell us what you offer. So we'll start with Brendan and Brittany, if that's okay, because you happen to be the right of me. <laughs> so um, we'll go with you guys. Sure, so we are um, a, uh... Bagel Bakery Cafe uh, down in Hamilton. Uh, we serve uh, predominantly a, a college-based demographic because we're with uh, Colgate University. Um, we make everything that we serve here on site. Um, and we are, we're in the middle of a prep shift, so we apologize. <laughs> it's okay. Ambient. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just um, excited that you guys took the time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for inviting us. Uh, we really started the business in 2015, but the brick and mortar wasn't open until July of 2016. So that puts us at five, just over five, just years. over five years. Yeah. Six years as flour and salt, but five years at our brick and mortar. And um, we were crazy enough in this past year to actually open a second business in town, um, which is a specialty grocery store and tavern. Uh, we we primarily uh, make bagel sandwiches, breakfast sandwiches here at the bakery. We, we make all our, our bagels on site. And then um, we also have several pastry chefs and we do special order cakes, a lot of special order items. I have, I think 150 cupcakes behind me on, that are ready to go out for an order later in the week. Um, and we also make, uh, we have an espresso bar, we make coffee. Thank you so much. Um, and they also had a baby during this time too. So they are moving and shaking and have a lot of moving parts going on. So got this brick and mortar going, um, had a baby and then opened up another brick and mortar in town. So busy guys for sure. Um, Tucker, how about you? How about you start and tell us um, about your restaurant and how many years in business? I, I stayed at the location in Madison, New York. If anybody's... Um, Curious as to where that is, it's right on Route 20. Can't miss it. So take it away, Tucker. Doing all three of those things during all this has been absurdly <laughs> difficult, um, but they handle it so awesome. We love uh, supporting everybody around us and, and those, guys are, those guys are great. Uh, we are, like she said, barbecue restaurant. Um, we started in 2014. We took over the uh, the early part of that year, and then we opened up. And uh, it's it's been kind of a, a growth in process right at the right at our location. Um, we started with just just the restaurant, sat about 60 ta uh, 60 people, uh, maybe about 14 15 people when we first started. Um, Right before the pandemic, we, with the help of Melissa and, and uh, some of the um, 
PCD and Hamilton and Hamilton Initiative and things like that, we were able to do some expansion. Uh, we added on a bar room that we can have more waiting and more seating. Um, we added a 3,500 square foot commercial kitchen to be able to move more into the catering aspect of what we do, uh, just making it a little easier on our employees. Um, that was trans that right at that was finished and then it began uh so you know we had to navigate through some of those things and how to how to keep ourselves uh with employees and keep it afloat but um you know we've been there since then we kind of got through it with to-go business and uh we offer like she had said we're a music venue as well as what we do for food um we do quite a bit of catering, uh, you know, when the world came back and, and catering was a thing again, um, it came full force. So we've been doing whatever we can to uh, at least fill as many of those dates and, and uh, requests as we can. But uh, that's the, the part is what we've been doing. Uh, but other, uh, we have great employees, really great staff um we've gotten to about 35 employees at this point and uh every one of them you know has, uh, has done above and beyond for us through this last year to help us keep going i'm gonna put it i want to actually circle back to that um tucker because i think that you're you and um Byron Sal, i happen to know personally so well so um Matt, I'm I, I'm gonna pick your brain on this too because I, I don't know the answer to this. So Mark probably knows, but you guys seem to always have such a large the the employee list that you have. I mean, I I get calls all the time. I'm I'm struggling to find people. I can't keep people. So I definitely want to hear your recommendations on that. So I want to circle back to that when we're in the thick of the questions. Um, I made a note of it because you know even last night when I went to Ray Brothers, I, those girls. The, your weight stuff I, they've been there for years I see them all the time they know my face I know their face I mean we frequent there a lot so um I I think that you have valuable insight to that because I I definitely like over the weekend got asked a question by a local restaurant um I can't find them they had to shut down this weekend because they didn't have anybody to work so um that's a big problem right now and so whatever you're doing seems to be working so we're definitely going to go back to that so um Matt from Hope Half Cafe, can you tell us about your business and how many years you've been there, your location and what you offer? Absolutely. So Hope Cafe um, is kind of an offshoot of our charity. Uh, we've had a charity since 2004 and wanted to uh, have a, a steady source of income and, and ability to uh, service uh, the projects that we have. And so we formed Hope Cafe uh, it actually would have been four years ago last month um, in Liverpool, New York. We were originally located in basically a mini mall, uh, and we started off a, a little crazy with about 50-seat uh, locale for a coffee shop, which is a little nuts to begin with when you're unheard of and starting a brand-new project. But uh, things went really well, and... Uh, we were moving along at being in a relatively hidden spot in a, in a town that didn't allow uh, signage <laughs> on the building or anything. And um, word of mouth really helped us quite a bit. And then uh, the pandemic hit and uh, our business overnight, literally overnight when the dining stopped went down by 82%. So, um, you know, the fact that we had to readjust everything you could think of in order to survive. But then just five months ago, we moved to a new locale. It's a locale that has a patio. It's uh, We could probably fit about 80 seats in there, has a drive through. So it's it's been really good. Um, we have, uh, we do quite a few things quite differently than most coffee houses. Number one, uh, we have a big focus on some of the countries that we've done work in with our charity. Uh, the most important being Peru. The Peru uh, has a phenomenal food scene. They've been voted the best uh, place, uh, the best food destination in the world for about seven or eight years in a row. And so we highlight a lot of Peruvian um, uh, fare, things that you could eat on the fly or, or sit down uh, and have like chicharron sandwiches and empanadas. And then we have a lot of fusion things, like even our breakfast sandwiches have the Peruvian sauces on them and things like that. 
Uh, and then we we also tried to match some of the roasting styles. You know, in America, since Starbucks and Pete's kind of took over, um, charring your your coffee to a crisp has been the most popular thing. And, and these uber dark roasts, and and we go an opposite way, which is it, it was a challenge, you know, to get people to understand why we do that and, and the reasons behind that. But things have been good, and word of mouth has been phenomenal for us. Now that we have a new locale, business is up quite a bit as well. Uh, it's over on 920 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, and we're just, I'm actually sitting on a construction site uh, because we're getting ready to open a second locale here in Clay, New York, so. Oh, awesome. That's, That's great. good stuff. So let me ask you really quick, that second loca location, is it similar in the sense of um, the drive through the patio seating? Is I wish. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, is that like a huge thing right now? Is that something that people should think about when looking for a location? Those things that happen to be a little different that the drive through, you know, you can keep that going in a, in well, a shutdown for the most part. And then the patio being outside. That was huge for us because the two weeks to slow the curve is now on its second year. And, um, you know, when, when, I think it was June that we were finally allowed to have full seating. And so you're, you're talking well over a year of having diminished seating. Uh, for us, we were kind of in a hidden location. So you had to get out of your car, walk through a mall and come inside. So we wanted to go the polar opposite route and having the patio and having the, the, the um, drive through was huge for us. Over here, we're on a, we're on a major highway, uh, Route 57, uh, which is phenomenal. And so we're going to do like a pickup curbside uh, service. We're going to have a couple of spaces. We have a guy um, who a few of the people on the call here probably know who set up uh, online ordering for us. So we have our own uh, online system. So people just order ahead. They come pick it up. So those are things that we had to really adjust because of the pandemic. Um, we, we were originally almost, I'd say 85% sit down just because the ambiance is so nice and the seating so comfortable. And then to go to 0% overnight was huge. So yeah, we, for us that drive through is very big because all uh, people order online and just come pick it up 10 minutes later. Uh, and that's probably at this point, 40% of our overall business. That's great to know. And I think that's something that people should keep in mind when looking for places if, if you're a startup. Um, and that's going to segue way into, you know, what are the main challenges you're seeing within the industry net right now? And I know, um, Brendan and Brady, you did an online ordering and you guys did that before pandemic, didn't you? Or was that kind of always part of your business model? You could do that online ordering or am I incorrect on that? No, that's right. I think in 2017 or 18 is when we added that. Um, we've switched back and forth between a couple of platforms, but we initially brought it on because we needed to find a way to redirect some of the student flow because we like literally couldn't fit more bodies in here on a Saturday. So we were hoping to redirect some of the ordering to online ordering so people could just pop in and pick up. So yeah, we were set up when the pandemic hit, we were, we were ready to go, which was really helpful. We're, we were already built for to, to go, go service, yeah. you know, so that made it really easy. Yeah, you kind of had that foresight. And it's interesting because I do remember going in there in your early years and literally like, if you didn't get there at a certain time, you weren't getting a bagel and you weren't getting in the door. And that, that line was wrapped around your, your outside. And so it's kind of interesting that that sort of happened way before the pandemic and got you on the mode of like, we have to do something different to redirect body flow yeah. and traffic. Um, what other challenges are you seeing with the, the pandemic and, and how have you sort of navigated that? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a really direct and tangible one is just sourcing food product. So um, maintaining consistency with our menu has been a little difficult. We've cut quite a bit of stuff, um, mostly because I just don't want to spend every week having our front of house staff telling people that we're out of something we have it this week, we don't have it next week. The price changes are also really impressive. Like there are tons of fluctuations with flour and dairy. Um, so that's been just something to keep an eye on and, and track and deal with and then properly price so that we're not getting gouged by inventory costs and hoping that our customers follow suit and are comfortable with paying a higher price for food. Um, I don't know if you want to touch anything else. Sure. Um, I think managing customer expectations in general has been 
more difficult. Um, you know, it's it, for a while, either you, if you were operating as safely as you could, you were alienating a certain population. And now it seems to be going the other way where if you're choosing to operate as safely as possible, then you're alienating, um, or if, you're, if we're, we're reducing the safety measures, now we're alienating a, a new population. Um, and it's, it's been difficult to try to figure out where the middle ground exists. Yeah, I think the onus was on the small businesses, right? When that, when that hammer first came down um, to be policing people wearing masks or policing whether or not people were eating indoors, like that was all on us. And then for a brief moment, we were wondering if, and Tucker had this experience with outdoor events, like am I checking people's vaccination status now? This is my job. So um, it's something that you want to do to build confidence in some of your customer base, but like Brendan said, in another way, like so you have other parts of your customer base are going to find that disappointing or frustrating. Or, so whichever way you yeah. chose, you were alienating a certain population yeah. of your customer base. Um, and it wasn't about food anymore. Like we work in the food service industry. It just suddenly we were police of something that we never thought we'd have to be police of. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, I, I think that that can speak true to all industries um, where people have to come in and out of. And I mean, especially the restaurant business, like you're talking about, like, you know, I remember, going in and, and being like, yeah, what do I do? Do I wear a mask or I not? Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I went to Hamilton this weekend and was wandering around and I was, it was interesting how many stores had, if you, you cannot come in without a mask. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, I'm vaccinated. So I didn't think anything. I walk around a lot in Casnovia, that's where I live. And I walk in and out all day long and I don't wear a mask because all the doors are open and the flows and, and, you know, especially this time of year it's, it's, and we've been so lucky with the weather. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went to Hamilton, I was like, oh my gosh, everything, all my masks are in my car. But what was nice was that like, I went into the college bookstore and they had disposable ones right there, ready to go. So like things like little things like that, I think are super helpful to a customer like myself, because not that I'm opposed to wearing them, it's just like, didn't grab it. Cause I'm so used to walking around CAS where like literally everybody's doors are open and it just kind of flows and there's no sign saying that you have to do it different towns are doing different things, right? So I think that is a huge kind of thing, like trying to figure out what works for your town and your customer base. Um, We've made a decision early on to follow suit with whatever uh, suggestions are made by the university because so much of our population is associated with the university. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it made it really easy to make a decision about it. If we That's knew that- yeah. A large portion of our of our demographic already has a rule set up, then we're just going to stick with that and it makes it really easy for the majority of our population. Yeah, and we're also in constant contact with all of the, particularly food service businesses in the village, but all of the businesses, because it's so much easier to present a united front on something yeah. than to, for everyone to be doing something differently. So I think that's been a conversation that's being had in Hamilton a lot. That's very interesting to hear. and. Um, uh, Matt at Hope Cafe, you're in Liverpool. Are you, as are, are a group of businesses doing the same kind of thing? Are you all trying to collaborate and work together and kind of be on a united front or is everybody kind of man for themselves? I mean, we've been so busy. I haven't really spoken with too many people. So I, I uh, you know, between the move and trying to get this new place open and the increase in business, um, I haven't had a whole lot of those conversations. So I don't know. We're just kind of doing our own thing, to be honest with you. But that also shows the difference in the population of the towns. Like Hamilton's a very small, close knit town. Everybody knows everybody. And in Liverpool, it's a lot bigger. And I'm sure it's the same thing. It's sort of everybody kind of knows everybody in a sense, but like how much you interact with people is a different story, probably. Well, and in our case, it's uh, because of the fact that we're offering a kind of unique ethnic experience. We have people coming in from all over. Most, a lot of them are not even from Liverpool. And so um, it, it'd be hard to consolidate that on our end, I think. And, and I think one of the ways that you're, you seem to be navigating this challenge is I, I keep hearing common theme of like uniqueness from you. Like you have the patio, you have the drive-through, you have the Peruvian food, you really tried to um, offer this kind of experience that's different and unique. And I, I think that's like a big theme that I keep hearing from, from you. Am I wrong? Am I right? 
No, you're hundred percent right. I think, uh, you know, if, if you could get the same exact product somewhere else then you know, we, we would be failing and missing the mark in what we're doing. And, um, especially I, I think it's easy if, if you're doing something like what we're doing, which is for a charity and it's for a, a purpose. Um, it's easy to rely on that and just, uh, submit a, a you know, a subpar uh, product and, People, some people come in or some church people might come in to help, you know, give an education to some kids or whatever. But when when you're actually offering, uh, you know, good food and good drinks and something unique and something different, then they see, oh, they're not just phoning it in. They, they actually care. This is this is legit. This isn't just someone trying to get some money for their charity. They really care about the food aspect of it, too. That's a really good point. So when thinking about starting your business in the restaurant world or if you're already in it, what could you do to be unique? Unique is a huge thing, and then absolutely, we visited probably fifty different cafes throughout the CMI area before we decided what we were going to do because I didn't want to have the same menu everybody else had. Yeah, that's a great. Point. And I didn't want to put Edison lights. You know? Hey, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. You know, just just a quick point. You know, I think with any of the um, the businesses we're talking about here, or you know, that we're we're not even that are not even on the phone. Any restaurant, I think, or cafe. Um, you name it, nowadays has to figure out a way, how do they differentiate themselves in the community and how do they provide value that, that somebody else isn't providing? And I think each of the, you know, the participants today sounds like they're, they're differentiating themselves in the community. And, um, and I think that's the thing to kind of stay focused on, you know, when it, when it comes to this is how do you continue to provide value in the eyes of the, your consumer? Because, um, it's, it's really easy for them to, to find another venue. Um, but you guys are all doing that job right now. Absolutely. And I, and, and Tucker, you can jump in on this one for sure. I know as a customer, when I go to Tucker, like it feels like family and that goes back to that employee feel. Um, you have these 35 employees. And like I said, I've seen the same people for years now. Um, you're obviously making a culture that they want to stay in. It's not a high turnover, at least from the outside looking in. It maybe feels like that to you. I'm not sure. But from the outside looking in, it doesn't look like that. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges you're seeing in your industry and like what you've done to sort of mitigate those challenges? I mean, <clears throat> the staffing has has definitely been an issue. It's been a a huge hurdle to try and overcome as uh you know the world opened up and punched us in the mouth a little bit it was uh you know we thought we were ready we sat there we we want this and, and then it was there and it was there in abundance so it, to fill the positions that uh you know that we lacked because of having to lay a few people off having to do those kind of things but it definitely you know when colin and i started this <clears throat> Uh, this restaurant, it was first and foremost about our passion for food, but then, you know, the, the very close second is creating that culture, creating a family. Um, you know, we try and say through this part, when, when I interview someone now, um, it's a little different than what I did, you know, pre pandemic, because I come to these people and, and kind of say, well, look, I can hire any anyone can be a server, anyone can be a bartender, we can train you how to do whatever it is we do. Um, but if you're not going to fit in our family, or we might not fit in yours, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's just not going to work. So we try and just explain to uh, everyone that comes in the door and puts an application in that um, we're hiring them as a person and not what they're going to do for us. So that kind of bridges a little bit of a gap. Um, we try and take uh, a, their first week to let them feel us out, we feel them out and uh, move forward. With that. But the trickiest part, I think, has been, uh, you know, maybe not members of staff, but it's, it's the, I don't want to say quality, that's probably not the right word, but, you know, we have a younger staff now, much younger, and they just don't have uh, experience to get that worth ethic, ethic on and uh to really you know put that best foot forward they're just trying to kind of fill a job you know and and make some money they're not they're not fully invested like a lot of the industry people were before the pandemic that maybe aren't there anymore um so that's been our trickiest thing um <clears throat> and just to kind of piggyback on that and and the whole country doing this um you know brendan and Brittany talked about supply chain and and what we 
the lack of that. We're seeing that even if we can order the food, you know, these companies don't have the staff to drive it to us. So, you know, even it's even the trucking and the, uh, you know, those kind of things, the people packing the trucks and then getting it to us is, uh, is a problem. So not only is inflation going up, food, if you can get it, and then when you can get it, can you even get it to me? You know, so these are all just that, that we've just tried to face. And luckily our menu, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the nuts and bolts not changed day one. We, we kind of, what we, um, we haven't really gone with any, you know, different types of food trends because we just cook meat. That's all we have to do. So, <laughs> um, we just kind of follow through with that kind of thing. And, and, uh, luckily we've got a great, group and and uh like i said we call them our family and and they uh they buy it crazily enough to what colin and i you know have this vision. So, um part that i i will mention you know that very business that uh everyone's talking about for your your online ordering and your, your now we only did to go and we did it a lot longer than most we uh for seating at all until we get about that 75 um, for a good eight, nine, and, um, we, we have a unique product where we, we can't be on the fly well, that when it's gone, it's gone kind of thing. So what we faced with the dilemma this summer, where we had an influx of dining instead of our shows, uh, we had to actually up to go is because we couldn't keep up with with supply chain and with uh, food um, so we were we're a little bit how much we've probably ticked off the to-go person through the summer and you know now that school's weather gets a little cooler you know your your week nights go down just a hair so now we'll that back up but you know it's it's a it's just a, a balancing act for us so yeah, and how do you think that you, um, how do you continue to let your clients know, your customer base know the changes? Is it your social media? Is it your website? Is it signage? Is it like, how do you, or is it word of mouth? Majority of what we do is is our social media. We're, we're fortunate enough to have, you know, quite a few people following and liking our pages. Um, so, you know, those kind of things, that's that's our quickest way to get it, get it out there, um, you know people call for an order we make sure that the voicemail says what we're doing that day because it does change by the day um and it it somewhat has to do with staff but a majority of it has to do with um us actually kind of caring for those cooks back there you know if we were to add a a full night of to-go business as well as you know seating i think we're up to i don't know about 120 if we seat our outside in, you know and it's keeping those employees not hating their lives <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I think um I that that theme of the employees being happy um you know even just in a and not in the restaurant business in every business the the work-life balance thing keeps coming into play I mean you watch the news and everybody's talking about um what did you learn during the pandemic what did you learn during the time at home and what is it that you really want? I mean, there's a huge thing on the Today Show this morning about um, they're calling it the uh, quarter life crisis instead of the midlife crisis. So Brittany and I have already had that. We had that, um, we were both teachers and we both uh, <laughs> left teaching <laughs> to follow our passion of entrepreneurship. And um, and I'm looking back on it, I'm like, yeah, I was a quarter life, like that, that's the age that I was. And I think you were about the same, maybe um, right around there. And um, they were talking about all these, like these 20 something year olds, 30 or something year olds that left their, um, their corporate jobs, left their desk jobs, and now uh, are into farming. And so that was all over the Today Show this morning as I was walking out the door. I was like, oh, look at, and they were talking about greener pastures and, and, and how these individuals were like, you know, I want to be out in nature. I want to be outside. I, want to be, I don't want to be stuck at a desk. I don't want to be even remote working in my house. I want to be enjoying the world. So I think that keeping your employees happy is a big way to keep them 
here and working with you. Um, so, you know, what other, what other things can you suggest um, from the three businesses to help mitigate someone's risk with the challenges that we're facing today? I mean, I know Mark Cardone is, a, um, Mark and I work together a lot. He is a commercial real estate agent and we send him a lot of different clients looking for spaces. So Mark, I know we're still getting restaurant businesses coming in saying, I wanna start this, I wanna do this. Um, I'm, I'm, I know I've sent you a few recently and know other people have. Um, so we're, we are seeing that restaurants still wanna open up. They still wanna do something. So what do you suggest to help with these challenges, to to um, to be getting ready for opening these businesses, do, does anybody want to go? I'll just throw it out there for um, all three businesses. Whoever wants to go first, any suggestions? Don't do it. Run away. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. Um, um, I so something that Brendan and I did when I was getting ready to open Florence Hall, because it was initially just myself. I talked to Tucker. He was one person I talked to like at length. I spoke to him and Colin for a while. And I talked to Clay and Nikki at the eatery. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke to Tim Hardiman over when he had Utica bread. Um, he took me around for a two and a half hour tour of his entire bakery. Like I think people, in the, this is always my number one piece of advice. I think people in the food service industry are so ready to talk about what they've done partially from the standpoint of like not wanting someone else to make the same mistake. Maybe. Yeah. Like I yeah. want you to learn from the wisdom I've gained in five years so that potentially it could be a little bit smoother of a road for you. So I think I've always found no matter how close or far um, a business is, whether or not you're kind of like in the same realm in terms of competition, like people are always happy to talk to you and, and help you with problem solving. So I would spend a lot of my time just going around to bagel shops all over central New York, asking to see their kitchen, seeing a piece of equipment I'd never seen before and being like, do I need that? What is that? I don't even know what that is. So yeah, that would be my recommendation if, if someone's getting ready to jump in. I think that's huge. That primary data, like I can tell you, Mark Rosando can tell you, we can, Mark Cardone can tell you, but we're not in it. We don't live it and eat it, breathe it, sleep it. Like we, I'm not worried about making my orders and if they're going to come in and I can't tell you how to, um, you know, make your atmosphere in your, in your restaurant, a culture of family, because I'm not in it every day. I don't know what the hours in the grueling time that you spend um, every day, all day long, seven days a week feels like. So that primary data is huge. And I always say that too, is go research, go talk. Um, I know a lot of people like Brittany was saying, like, you know, might you feel like it's, it's a little bit of, um, uh, competition or whatever and some of the things you need some of the places you named are very close to you if you feel uncomfortable like that go talk to somebody outside of the area don't you don't have to go close by I mean I know some people feel uncomfortable about that Brittany and I are teachers and we're like edu you know we're into the research part so we're just we put ourselves out there because that's what we do um, but I get it like some people are like eh, I feel uncomfortable doing that but I think that the more you do that the better off you are so that's a great piece of advice um, how about you, Matt? What do you, what do you think? Well, first of all, shout out, uh, shout out to, uh, not a shout out, a shout out to Mark <laughs> Cardone. He, uh, he helped us get our space too. So oh, I, awesome. I can vouch for the guy, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, honestly, I think, uh, exactly what they said is very important. You, you really need to do a lot of research ahead of time. You need to study, study market trends, not just here, but, but nationally and, even internationally, um, study uh, uh, what other places that are successful are doing um, and things like that. But I, I think it's also incredibly important to um, uh, prepare properly. You, ne you need to really do uh, your, your homework on the preparation side. How long does it take us to make a bagel sandwich? How long does it take us to smoke the meat, to shred the meat? So whatever you're doing, whatever, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're doing, you might have done on a small scale and said, okay, I could get this uh, done in this amount of time, but you, you need to be very um, concerned with people's time because I don't know what happened in the last two years, but people are in a rush now. They don't always want to sit and eat for an hour or two hours. Sometimes, yeah, and especially if you're doing 
um, an evening thing, but you also want to have that turnover. So you want to get people in and you want to get them out and um, you have to really get your timing down. You, you have to really work on your service. That is incredibly important. No matter what's going on, you better treat people like gold uh, because they do have a million other options and they'll find a million faults. If you're wearing a mask, they won't like you. If you're not wearing a mask, they won't like you, you know, whatever you're. And then on top of that, be incredibly flexible. Uh, you have to reassess when you first start, reassess yourself that first week, that second week, that third week, and then do it every single month. Reassess all all of your foods, uh, you know, what are we selling? We thought this was going to be the number one seller. It plopped, forget it. It's gone. Get it off the menu and move on and, and um, focus on what you're doing. Because I think at least in the beginning, sometimes a lot of places offer too much and they don't do a good job at eight out of the 20 things that they do offer 12 that you do a good job at, you know, um, because it, for me, if I'm coming in and it's my first time and I had something that's all right, uh, but it's nothing special. I might come back six months later, but if I only had 12 things to choose from and every single one of them was phenomenal, you can guarantee I'll be back next week to get it again. So I agree with that. 100% know your niche, know what you're good at, you know, focus yeah. on what you're good at. Um, like I stress that all the time with any industry that we work with, because a lot of times people come in and say, well, I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. I, and you're trying to please everybody and you're not going to be able to. And I think that's something that, you know, Tucker and I've had conversations with and Florence Alton, I've had conversations about you, you're not going to make everybody happy at all times. Tucker and I had this conversation last night. Um, my husband said, well, do you ever think about adding on, well, you're, he's doing this awning on his patio so that he can do more outside um, time throughout the year. So there's going to be some heaters in there, but it's, it's basically you know, appeasing to the people that want to stay outside more. Um, and, and my husband's like, well, do you ever think about like doing a whole new section of, 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 of um, to, to offer even more seating that way you have? And your response was perfect. You were like, well, I think that we still, we're doing a good job. Our food is good. People keep coming and they don't mind the weight because they want the product. Um, your menu is not super extensive. It is, it's, I don't want to say basic because that makes it sound not great. It's phenomenal. It's unique. And when you get what you get, every time you get it, it tastes the same. It, it doesn't ever vary in the sense of, um, well, last time I got, it was really good. And this time it was like, oh, well, not so great. It's always good quality, if not excellent quality. And so I think there's something to be said for that. So, um, I, you know, you can jump in, Tucker. I'm talking for you. <laughs> and you need to be the one talking. Number one goal, we our entire lives. The inconsistencies with restaurants is definitely what turns people away. You know, yeah. if you've got somebody that walked in the door, had a phenomenal, and then they came back two weeks later and it wasn't good, uh, they're going to tell people about that. We're like, yeah, one time it was good, one time it was you know, you you're hoping you can offer the same experience um, to that guest and, and not just food. You've, you've got to give them the atmosphere. You've got to give them, the, you know, the uh, uh, feed of it, the, you know, the good service. And, you know, we're, a, we're slow cooked. People like to sit in the seats for a long time. So, you know, turning for us uh, is tricky. Um, slowly a few more and added a few more because, rather than over as much eating. So obviously the outdoor thing, if we can get installed here shortly, you know, that, that's an extra area with a little bit of heat that um, there's definitely a demographic that would wants to sit out, want to be indoor when uh, available. You know, um, sounds like Hope Cafe's got, you know, patio area, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's a that's a huge thing nowadays. Experience what you have, but in a little not in. <laughs> We've done, um, you know, just uh, you guys are saying the fact for everyone, I guess I should say. Um, we do a, you know, you got to brush off with you. Um, I also love that. I feel anyway in our area, Utica, there, um, you know, right out to where we are in Hamilton. We're we're a unique spot. 
we are literally in a cornfield in the middle. People mm-hmm. are destination. One's walking, to, um, you know, riding a bike. They have to drive, have to make it an event to come see you. Um, people have learned you're going to wait. So it, it becomes your whole evening. Uh, and uh, people doing that, you know, we have to, I, we, I tell all the employees all the time, we have to step it up. People are making their, their family. Yeah, so we need that to be a great experience and you know not, and you know but uh the the camaraderie and um in the industry i think brennan and Brittany, myself um she mentioned tim hardiman uh at um taylor cook michael from michael's out by us mm-hmm. uh john we were literally on the phone with each other, I'd say four or five times a week when this began, because we are our own, you know, within the industry. Even though we, have, we, we know what the other person is going through, whether the demographics are a bit different or not. We're only five, eight miles outside of Hamilton, but traffic is more conservative than the, the Hamilton town that's a little or liberal, you know, things like that. I have all ends of the spectrum because we're not a specific area. So we have to kind of do our best to hear everyone to the door. So um, it's tricky, but so far, you know, it, it, it's we've uh, just stuck to the same bone while yeah. adapting. Yeah, and I think the, the, the thing with all three of you is that the, the quality of food, um, the quality of service. I mean, Brittany's bagels are second to none. I mean, they're amazing. And the, the, and the cream I don't, anymore. I don't make them to the credit. Well, they're, your recipe is still amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, when I take them places, um, everybody raves where they come from, where did you get them? And, and, and I, they're like, did you drive to New York city to get them? And no, just a little shop in Hamilton, but the same thing with, with um, Matt and the whole cafe, it's that you're, the products you have are so unique. And I think that's really what stands out to the customer. They're going for something different. They're going for what you can't get in other places. Um, I want to give um, us a little time we have a handful of people on here that might have questions. So Stephanie and Michael, um, feel free, ask some questions. I don't know what your status is. I don't know if you have um, businesses already or if you're looking to start one in the restaurant world, but please take the time. You've got three experts here that are navigating this well and, and continue to do so. And they're they're constantly moving forward with one foot in front of the other. So I, I'd love to have some time for you guys to ask some questions, either one of you. Do you want to tell us what you're like, Michael? Can I put you on the spot? What What are you thinking about doing, or what do you do? Sure, there. Um, so hold on one second. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna pull this off. Um, so yeah, so I'm just I recently uh, relocated back to Syracuse. Um, so I used to be a bread baker in Rochester, New York, uh, with the it was a village bakery and cafe. So I'm starting a bread bakery in Holly Green in Syracuse. Oh, cool. Um, so we're, we're looking to start that a few months in. So I just wanted to join this. I've been working with SBDC and saw this and just saw this was, um, I thought this would be a great resource to hear from you all. And thank you so much because this has already been so, so helpful. Oh, that's uh, awesome. That yeah. primary data, that's what Brittany was saying, primary data, asking people who are in it. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's, that's, um, so that's uh, what we found so helpful starting off in this journey is just talking with, with our, with our neighbors. There's a lot of food businesses right in our neighborhood. So again, that's, that's been so helpful. And to hear about the sourcing, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the online ordering aspects too, how that's changed through, through the industry. Um, so like I said, we recently relocated here, um, from, we were living in Rochester, but we, were, we spent two years in Cincinnati actually during the pandemic and I was working at a bagel shop um, and it was really interesting to see that bagel shop, how they changed with the online orders, 
Um, I know we've talked a lot about online orders, but delivery became a big issue with this bagel shop. Do any of the businesses deal with any delivery platforms or is it just exclusively online orders? Yeah, I mean, in our case, we use uh, Uber, uh, which I think uh, joined forces with Postmates, if I'm not mistaken, and we use uh, Grubhub. Um, but we, uh, our, our online system, it was something that was set up, you know, proprietary for us. Um, and uh, it, that, that's that been huge for us, specifically because we just took on the drive through So um, in a matter of five months, it's taken over, like I said, about 40% of our business, um, which is which is huge. But um, Grubhub, you know, it's one of those things that it builds up over time. Same thing with Uber Eats or um, uh, DoorDash. It, you know, it, when you first start it, you're going to go, oh, boy, this is worthless. But over time, it adds up. The problem with them is they charge you an arm and a leg. So if you have a delivery person, you're better off doing your own online system and and, uh, and having your delivery person deliver it. You'll you know, save your customers money and even yourself. But um, if you jack up your prices the right way, you'll still make money off Grubhub and DoorDash and all that. We did a little bit of delivery right at the beginning of the pandemic. We felt like, it was, especially when the, the whole village was sort of on lockdown, it was very relevant, but we had to set a pretty high minimum for it to be worthwhile for us. And um, from the insurance perspective, it was either Britty or I that was doing the delivery um, because in our little town, we don't have uh, Grubhub or any of the larger services. So we had to do it on our own. Um, and we've stopped doing it because we have sufficient business in the space now uh, for it to be sort of irrelevant for us. Um, mm -hmm. It was very important to do while we did it, I think more so to uh, build relationships with people and to show that we were doing something that was important, uh, keeping people safe through the pandemic. Um, I think the only incidents in which we would do it again is if there was another pandemic where things were shut down. Yeah, but that's yeah. a great point. That's a great point. Building those relationships. I know as a community member in my small town, if I saw my local, I did like Linkland House, for instance, they started doing deliveries. And um, they had the they had um, their son. I think it was their son doing it or family member doing it because right. of the insurance issues as well. But I know to me, like I've lived here for twenty something years, and I've never seen them deliver ever, ever, ever. And them doing that during that time, like it definitely checked a box for me. Of wow, they really are going out of their way. That customer service. So I think that's a great point. Um, so much to do. Uh, uh with customer service and creating a return customer, mm -hmm. um, the, the value of someone who has some loyalty to your brand, not only because of the way that they spread that information, but the long-term experience that you have with them is so valuable uh, yeah. that, um, you know, those sorts of efforts that you can do to sort of create and maintain those relationships are um, among the most important things you can do for a service. And I'd say if online ordering is important for you and it's something that you want to set up for your business, look into a couple different platforms. Um, also decide where you fall. If you're pretty tech savvy, it's, it's a huge cost saver for you to set it up yourself. The back ends can be a little clumsy sometimes, but you end up saving yourself a lot of money, both with the initial setup and whenever you have to deal with some sort of troubleshooting, if you're not calling support, you can handle it yourself. We use Square. Um, I don't know that we would if we weren't like so deep into using that point of sale system. I've heard really positive reviews about Toast. I think a lot of people love Toast Tab and it's a little bit more, it's engineered more for food service where Square is still kind of catching up to that. Um, but yeah, if it's not for you, then definitely hire somebody else to handle it because it can be, it's like one of the most stressful. I handle all of our back end for it. And it's definitely one of the most stressful things I do. There's also a certain element of understanding the customer's experience with yeah. the, the unit um, mm -hmm. because we uh, are fast service. We're casual, you know, fast serve. The, the customer interacts with the point of sale themselves and Square's uh, user interface is really uh, user friendly for the customer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it makes the customer feel good about the experience. They get to look at their whole order. They feel comfortable about it. And it's... Um, it, it adds a certain level of professionalism that they can get out of our space that maybe they won't get at, you know, whatever other bagel shop down the road. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, we did have a other a question from Michelle for everybody, and it says, "Have you had to increase your prices based on higher food cost and food shortage?" Anybody want to tackle that? Missed that. I'm sorry. Um, we recently made a small increase, mostly just to make it tax inclusive. Um, and honestly, it was more motivated by wanting to be able to pay our staff more than it was to cover food costs. So that was a, a bonus to kind of raise prices just a smidge to cover increased food costs, but we just want to be able to pay our people more per hour. And that's part of how we do that. So, yeah. Um, how about you, Tucker? Yes, we, there's a few things. We, we definitely have raised prices. Uh, I think you know, unknowingly, uh, but not, it, it, it really is geared towards taking care of, you know, you, you want to give them the wage you can while handling, you know, goes on with the business that you run <clears throat> and what New York state throws, at, you know, rules and regulations. We'd rather, we'd rather see go to our kids and you know that that's what we're doing. sure it's a board in, in almost every industry it sounds like but we have our payroll has certainly gone up um close to about 30 um recently because we have just made sure that you know these people are working for some reason it just feels difficult more difficult so everyone's working very hard it's life be more stressful um it's it's not just when they're in your four walls of your of your place you, people's lives outside of work as well because if they don't have something uh going well for them they're not going to come to work <laughs> so you know yeah. we've, we've extended things we make it so that you know people are open just for for work you know we we hope that we can turn them on to uh, help in any, you know, look, look towards all those things. And that's another way that we reach out to other restaurant owners and, you know, seeing what they're doing as well. How, how are they yeah. you know, getting, um, so it's been tricky The you know, online ordering for us, uh, please defer to Brendan and Bridget. Amazing job with that. Delivery is not for us. We're, are out, um, cost too much money in gas and, and insurances and time for for us to do you know just our physical thing but um so talk about online ordering <laughs> and we're also in small areas both us and tucker so a qualifying factor in us talking about delivery right where michael for you it might be more relevant your customer base is within like a five to 10 mile radius and it's really easy for you to reach all of them. So that would be something for you to assess based on your market. And I just wanted to mention, if you ever wanted to come down to Flower and Salt, we would be more than happy to give you a tour and pay it forward the way that all of these bakeries did for us. So please let us know if you ever want to chat further or see what we've got going on. I really appreciate that. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Thank you. I'll reach out. Thanks. How about you, Matt? Have you had to increase your, your prices? So I probably should have, but I haven't yet. Um, it, 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 you know, as you guys know, everybody was in the industry. I mean, at, uh, a year ago, we we're paying 1680 for uh, 30 gallons of uh, oil and now we're paying $44. So, you know, everything's gone through the roof. Um, but so far we have uh, held down the fort. I keep saying, okay, you know, it's going to turn around. If it doesn't soon, I'm going to have to raise them a little bit, but I'm going to try and keep it like to a very minimal amount. Um, I've made a lot of personal sacrifices in order not to do that, but there's only so much you could do um, before you run out of personal funding. So um, I think eventually uh, we may have to if this nonsense doesn't stop soon. I think that's a key thing too, you said, is the personal sacrifices. I know that you all have. I mean, everybody in small business has had to do something. Um, in our last coffee talk, and Mark Cardone can, can attest to this, we have a financial uh, literacy person that comes on. And when she starts talking about 
how to prep to, to start your business, one of the things she says is she really works on like saving money. And one of the things that she says is like, do you have cable? Are you paying $250 a month in cable? If you are, maybe you should get rid of cable and just do um, Apple TV for $6 a month or something, something else, like make some cuts so that you can save that other $150 you would be paying on cable and, and things like that. And I know there's things you could do in the, in, in, the, in the business as well. And, and Mark, you, you were on that call that we were all talked about that, like how to put that money aside, how to think about it. And so if you're not good at that, you're reaching out to people who are, who can help counsel you on that. Um, but personal sacrifices are huge. Uh, I had a client the other day say, how do you know it's time to leave your, your business to, to be full-time in your new business? And I think it really boils down to looking at your numbers. What do you need to make a month? And then how do you go about doing that? Um, do you have the traction? Do you have people? I mean, Brady, I, again, I, I go back to you. You sold at the farmer's market for one year and started doing special order catering. Um, you had a following before you invested a large amount of money into the brick and mortar. You kept, get, you kept going. Um, so that... That is, that is something to really consider when starting your own business is that you have to look at the overall numbers. What is it you have to have personally, but what can you also sacrifice personally? Um, Stephanie, I, I don't know if you, if you want to talk, you don't have to, do you want to tell us what you're, you're uh, thinking about doing or not? Or if sure, you're sure. Yeah. It's not in the restaurant industry or anything. Oh. So I, I do appreciate everything everybody said. It's very interesting to hear though, because I could imagine, you know, like what they're going through, but, um, I'm not, my business is not set up yet, but, um, I'm going to be doing coaching. So that's kind of, okay. it's a little bit different <laughs> than what we're speaking about now, but, um, but it's actually very interesting though, for me to hear what they're saying, you know, I yeah. kind of appreciate that. And just because everybody, everybody's business is going to have some kind of challenges and it's really how you adapt. So, you know, it's kind of good to just even hear and just kind of just get some ideas just in general, you know, because I think that's what everybody's been saying, that they've been adapting and what's going on in the world industry, then they're just trying to do what they can to, you know, basically enhance a customer experience. And that's what it is for every industry, I think. So, Absolutely. you know, it's good to always remember that. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's figuring out your niche. What are you good at? What is, what is something that, what are you unique? What, what makes you unique? What, what, what makes exactly. you just different from the others? So right. that's a, that's great. Thank you for being on. Um, oh, no problem. Thank you. Any other mm -hmm. questions? I want to be mindful of time. It's it's ten thirty one. Um, these guys have work to do, and I want to be mindful of their their obligations. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk and allowing us to record this to share. Um, any last questions? Any last words of wisdom? Mark, do you have any questions? Mark Pizzango, do you have any questions? No, I, I, I wish all of you good luck with either whether the ones that are in business or the ones that are starting their business. Yeah. And, and as Stephanie said, I think it's a good point. I don't think it matters. <clears throat> it does matter to some extent, but it doesn't matter what, what, whether you're selling a widget or um, you know, a cup of coffee or some. There are common threads in all of this that you have to be aware of, whether you're in business or you're starting your business. And I think... Um, you guys have all touched on them, all the different things that you have to be aware of. And I think it's been a great conversation. So, uh, you know, I, thanks for everybody being on. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, our panelists, any last words of advice you want to offer anybody? I just like to say, beware of burnout. <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> what, did I, I, uh, what did you say, Brendan? Um, I was just thinking about um, Tucker in particular, how he manages to keep so many of his employees on for so long and how you're able to build that family um, experience. And we have been trying to be more attentive to uh, burnout among our staff and ourselves and trying to create as much of a balance as we can, letting people take off when they need to and understanding that everyone has to you know, live their lives. So that's something to be mindful of. I think a great example that Tucker and Colin set for us too, while they were in business and we were not yet, they are almost always there. Like yeah. I think, I think of the businesses that went down fast, it was people who thought that they could kind of set things up and then leave. 
I had never, like Brendan and I both never wanted to be the kind of boss who hops on the espresso bar or gets on the line and our staff are like, oh, great, you're here. Like, <laughs> I want them to say, oh, great, you're here, like, you're here. Thank you're you. Here you're here to help me and I know that you know what you're doing. And as a small business owner, it's important that you know every single corner that you can always hop in anywhere. You can run the register, you can be a hostess, you can get on the bar, you can run the line, like, yeah. It's a lot of work, but it's, I think that is what is one of the more meaningful things to our staff is that they know that we're going to be here if they need us and, um, and Tucker and Colin have always been that way as well. So yeah, you, bo you both are. Yeah. I mean, it's very rare that you go into either one of their locations and one of them is not there. So that's, that's huge. Um, obviously Matt, you're there, you're there a lot as well. So I'm sure you can attest to it. It's uh, either myself or my wife is always present and, uh, you know, and, and it's very important because your, your quality control is, I mean, that's key to everything. And if you don't have quality control, you're in trouble. Um, I just want to say on a closing note, um, I got uh, definitely a, a new place to try barbecue and bagels. So I'm excited <laughs> about that. And uh, Stephanie, I'll tell you quite a few people uh, who are life coaches come and, and do uh, sessions right out of our cafe especially some of them have been doing it for many years and have their own offices and things. Um, but some of the, a lot of them that are starting out, do it right there. It's a huge expense saver. So just a little pointer there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm in Long Island though. So I'm a little far. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, no, I, I didn't mean my cafe. I just mean a cafe in general. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Okay. So that's oh, interesting. Yeah. I never thought about something like that. That's Believe good, it or uh... not, a lot of people get started that way. And even a lot yeah. of people have been doing it for a long time. Just because it's more casual, you have a cup of coffee, sit down and talk and uh, right. people like it. So that's a good idea. Thank you so much for that idea. I appreciate it. And by the way, Ste Stephanie, I, I would tell you, it might be worth the trip to go to Matt's place. The food okay. is rather, rather tasty. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, if you're up to say you got to hit up the three restaurants. Okay. I will. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. I'm, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of this. And we will send this out to the three restaurants. Um, so if you want to put it on your social media, um, please feel free. We're going to post it on ours. And again, thank you for your time. And thank you for your expertise. We can't do this without you guys. Um, you, you guys are the backbone of our small business. So thank you so much. And everybody have a great day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.